Okay, so designing your distillery. There's four categories, four sets of factors that you have to take into account when you're designing your distillery. And each of these has two subcategories or two sub factors. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, space factors. Now, under space factors, we need to consider the production flow that has to happen within that space, as well as the production areas. Now, the areas get quite complicated because you have to think of hygiene, dirty areas versus clean areas. You have to think of fire risk, flammable versus non-flammable areas. And then, obviously, the most important, your SARS areas, your VMP, VMS, and BOND. These need to be considered when you're actually doing your layout. Um, production flow is, is there enough space to actually do what I need to do? Is there a logical flow in the process? Because you don't want to go back and forth within your space. But then the part that most people overlook, is there enough space to do everything that I want to do, including tours? Because remember, if you want to do a tour through your distillery, that means there has to be a large enough space that a, not big, but group of people can walk through that space without interfering with your operational requirements and without endangering themselves. Now, this can include up to the point of where you actually have to put a chain or a guardrail or something there, because what you don't want is your still is running and it's hot and now this little kid runs and puts his hand on it and burns himself. And now he gets sued for injury. Okay, yeah, you've got your signs up and so on, but still, you don't want that to happen. So you need to consider that space issue as well for all my activities. Maybe I want to leave additional space so that people can actually do something in the distillery, have a, a long table dinner inside the distillery, have a wedding inside the distillery. We're going to talk about that uh, as well, looking at peripheral income streams and what else can I do in the distillery to generate income. But all these things need to be considered. Now, as to how much space you actually need, for the physical production process, not that much. Um, in our previous premises, which was half the size of this, we actually had a distillery inside the Stalik. That was before they realized they weren't supposed to give us a license. Unfortunately, there's no f such thing as precedent when it comes to licenses being granted. But if you take from the middle of that door to where that camera is to here, that's 35 squ this 35 square meters was a distillery and had the potential to produce 5,000 bottles a month from scratch, from grain, with a mash tun was Heinrich's distillery, was uh, called Lost Creek Distillery. But Heinrich sat on a swivel chair in the middle, and he would turn between his uh, mash tun, his fermentation tank, his shipping still, his rectifying still, and his bottling table, literally turning it around in a little circle. There was no way you could do a tour of tasting in there. So the actual production space, not that much. But do I want people in there? Do I want a tasting area? Do I want an office? Where am I going to store my bottles? Where am I going to store my raw material? Heinrich had to rent a storage unit and bring it here as he needed it. So how much space do I need to do everything that I want to do and have enough space to grow? Now, a standard light industrial facility, you're probably looking at about 150 square meters. That's more than enough. 150 square meters is more than enough to have storage space, a distillery that can grow up to about 8,000 bottles a month, um, a tasting room area, and an office area. That's more than enough space. That is half this part of the building, excluding the, fr uh, the front. OK. So production flow, what actually happens inside? You've got your raw material receival area. That's where your grain comes in, your molasses comes in, your raw material comes in. Then your raw, raw material processing area. Now, if you're working from grain, if at all possible you want to bypass that, you do not want to mill your own grain. Unless you're on a farm, you do not want to mill your own grain. It's messy, it makes a hell of a lot of dust, your neighbors will hate you, and it can be dangerous. Grain dust is explosive, it can cause a fire or cause an explosion. So you'll have to do that outside. But can you now imagine, I start up a hammer mill outside here in this complex. Can you imagine what this vehicle licensing place's clients' cars are going to look like? No. Not going to happen. So working from grain, you want to buy, uh, buy in already milled, if at all possible. Like I said, if you're growing your own grain on the farm, no problem. You've got an outside shed, you can mill your own. Otherwise, no, you buy it in already processed. But raw material processing does not just include the actual milling part and the processing part. It's also the physical making of the fermentation. 
your heated infusion tank, throwing in your molasses and the hot water to dissolve it to make your rum fermentation, doing your starch conversion on your grain, etc., etc. That is the processing part. That is a dirty process. Doesn't matter what you're dealing with, you're going to mess. There's going to be things to clean. You want to make it easy to clean. You want a, a sloped floor. You want a floor drain. You want to be able to take a, a wrap and spray the thing off and clean it at the end of time. It's messy. You want that area as far away as possible from your labels and bottles and boxes. I mean, can you imagine a roll of a thousand labels costing you nine rand a label, nine thousand rand roll? Oops, I got it wet. Poof, nine thousand rand gone. A spallet of packing boxes, branded packing boxes, costing you 15,000 rand. Oops, I spilled molasses on it. That's what I'm talking, clean areas versus dirty areas. You need to separate the activities so you don't compromise your product. And obviously, if you're going to go, if you want, thinking about it, I'm actually w looking at it now. Um, we've got a client uh, we, for the distillery in Vienna we, um, I'm designing. Um, EU has ASAP compliance, mandatory ASAP compliance. So if you want to export to the EU or to the UK, your distillery has to be ASAP compliant, otherwise they will not allow your product to be sold in the EU or the UK. Now, who knows what ASAP is? It's hygiene and critical control points. It's basically the thing that they started bringing in restaurants of South Africa, cold chain management, monitoring the process, needing the MSDS data sheets and so forth. It's not a requirement for distilleries in South Africa yet. It probably will be eventually. So, if you're thinking about exporting to those countries, you need to keep HACCP in mind. You need to keep the segregation of processes and storage areas separate. You have to keep that in mind in your design. But I mean, we do that as standard for all the distilleries we design anyway. Okay, then your fermentation preparation. As I said, part of the processing, actually making the fermentation. Then the fermentation process where your fermentation tanks stand. So already you can see there's a logical flow here. I get my raw material, I make my fermentation, now it goes into my fermentation tanks. After that comes my distillation process. Now distillation can be a single step or multiple steps. Am I going straight from fermentation to final product or am I doing fermentation, stripping run, spirit run, ginning run, maybe? That can be triple distilled. Maybe I want to do, with a conical still, I want to make old school Irish style whiskey, I want to do triple distilled and an Olympic pot still, then you'll be distilling three times through the same still. But you need the space for the stills, and if it's multiple still types, in between you'll need holding tanks. Because in the beginning, yeah, maybe not. In the beginning, it might be Monday, I'm doing a stripping run, Tuesday, I'm doing a spirit run, and um, uh, Wednesday, I'm doing a ginning run. Then physically, you can let the pipe run from the conical uh, stripping still into the column still and use the column still to store the low wines. You can do that. But if you're running all the equipment on the same day, you're stripping and spirit run and ginning run on the same day, then you need holding tanks in between to store the low wines or the intermediate pro products. Then comes your spirit enhancement process. Now, technically speaking, ginning would be a spirit enhancement process. I'm flavoring the spirit, I'm enhancing the spirit, I'm not making spirit. Other enhancement processes would be maceration. Having a tank a uh, heated infusion tank, for instance. I want to make rooibos gin. I let the rooibos leaves lie in the gin that I've already distilled and I'm uh, macerated. It could be airing or evaporation. Um, in the Europe, they talk about rousting, where you bubble air through the spirit to get rid of the residual volatiles using an air stone and an air compressor. It might be flavoring, adding an essence if I'm making a liqueur or a spirit aperitif. It might be sweetening if I'm doing obscuration on a brandy or, uh, or a rum. Whatever process you're using will be the spirit enhancement process. If I'm making barrel-aged rum, that would also be spirit enhancement process because my barrels stay in the production area. If it's brandy and whiskey, however, yes, it's still a spirit enhancement process, but now the barrels get taken <coughs> from the manufacturing area and put into bond. After that comes my bottling process. Now, my bottling process is fed by my packeting, uh, packing material receiving, packing material storage, and the packing material picking process, choosing what I'm going to use for which product. This all has to be in my clean area. I don't want that compromised by the production process. But in the bottling process, the packaging, the clean and the dirty, the spirit, comes together in the bottling line. Now, the bottling line consists of a couple of different things. It's not you sitting with a jug and pouring out into bottles. Believe me, you might so look, sound very crafty and look very crafty. You're going to do it for one day, and then you're going to jump on the phone and call me, and what do you have? Because you don't want to do that. So you need to wash the bottles. So you need a bottle washer or bottle rinser, because you can't use it from the pallet and fill it. There's dust in there. Then you have to fill the bottle, and now 
You get volumetric fillers and you get level fillers. So which type of filler are you going to use? Level fillers, more expensive, but it looks more professional because everything's on the shelf and they all look the same, regardless of bottle variances. With a volumetric filler, if the bottles aren't of good quality and there's slight discrepancies in the bottle, the neck level changes. So they don't look professional on the shelf. They all have a different neck level. People are going to think you're cheating them. So which type of filler are you going to use? Um, then you have to seal the bottle. So are you doing ROPP closure, which is the cheapest per closure, but the machine is 60,000 Rand, and it never works properly. That's why we stopped selling them. We just couldn't get them to work properly. We, we gave up. So you want an ROPP capper? I'm sorry, we can't help you. And we're not going to recommend anybody because we know they don't work properly. Um, if you want a proper ROPP capper, you're looking at 500 to 900,000 Rand for a line that can do that. So what do we use? We use the closures, pop-in closures, but those have to be sealed. Remember, there's a tamper-proof compliance requirement on bottles. You have to see if somebody opened the bottle before it. So that can either be a heat shrink a uh, seal, which is the most common, the plastic uh, seals, or wax dipping, which I love. I think it looks very crafty and cool, but it is expensive. Or you can put a sticker on. They never used to allow the stickers. Now the sticker can be allowed if it conforms to the requirements, meaning it can't be steamed so that the sticker goes off. It has to conform to legal requirements. But uh, all of that has to happen in a space, and then obviously you have to pack it in boxes, seal the boxes, and store the boxes. But that's your bottling and packing process. And then there's picking, shipment, and fulfillment, and finally it goes to the client. That's your flow that has to happen in the distillery. Now, if we apply that flow to the production areas, we see our yellow areas are low-risk areas, our red areas, that's our high-risk areas. The rest is, well, there's no risk. Uh, you can try as hard as you want. You're never going to light the fermentation on fire. I promise you. Ain't happening. Even turbo yeast, you're not going to get it to burn. But the moment we start distilling, and we're working with high percentage alcohol, now we're in a high risk area in terms of fire. The moment we've diluted down for bottling, which happens in the VMP, oh sorry, in the VMS, the secondary manufacturing warehouse, now we're low risk. 43% alcohol is still flammable, the flashpoint temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, but it is a lesser risk level than distillate this coming out of your still. This is also important to keep in mind when you're buying in alcohol. 96% alcohol is extremely flammable. Flashpoint temperature of about 13 degrees Celsius. So there is no way on this earth that you as a craft distiller will be able to afford to be legally compliant to store 96% alcohol. You can't do it. Because now you need halon gas units, you get multiple types of detectors, you have to build separate fame, uh, fireproof storage areas, and, and, and. The cost just escalates. So what do we do? Dilute it down. You're not going to infuse your gin at 96% anyway. You infuse between 40 and 60%. So the moment you receive the 96% alcohol, you dilute it down to your infusion strength, and you store it at your infusion strength. Less requirements from a fire department, and your losses due to evaporation is limited, because the higher the proof, the faster it evaporates, the more alcohol you lose. So it just makes sense. But that does mean that you need a larger holding tank. If you're going to buy in a 220-liter holding tank and you're going to dilute it down to 40%, uh, I'm going to need to spec you a 600-liter holding tank to store your received spirits. And that will be 600 liters for every 220-liter you buy at a time. So if you're buying a pallet of four drums, well, then you need a 1,600-liter holding tank to store your diluted spirits. That's how it works. Okay, so that's... Your fire safety areas. Then we've got our SARS areas. So the blue section, that's your VMP, your primary manufacturing warehouse. Your green areas is your VMS, your secondary manufacturing areas. So the line gets crossed here with the spirit production process. Okay? That's how it used to be. Okay? This has now changed, but it's now, this is again, remember what I said earlier, it depends on the person enforcing the legislation. Some of the inspectors still enforce this. So maceration, infusion, and so forth, they expect that to be in the VMS. Other inspectors enforce it this way, where the line is before bottling. Now, that makes more sense. Because some infusions, liqueur infusions, cherry liqueur, for instance, if you're macerating cherries in alcohol to make a cherry liqueur, that's six months. That means while you are still flavoring, while you're in spirit enhancement, you already have to pay your excise tax. doesn't make sense. That's against the goal of the law. 
So the proper interpretation of the law should be that when you cross into bottling, you're crossing into the VMS. And then we get, obviously, your bond. Bonded warehouse forms part of the spirit, uh, spirit enhancement process, as I explained. Now, I've already explained this slide. I'm not going to go into it in detail. But bonded warehouse, there's distilling activities for aging. Then you put it in a barrel, you put it in bond, and you take it out of bond before you bottle. Distillation activities for export goes, it goes all the way into the bottle, then into bond, and then you export. Spirit supplier, this is the last one I told you about with the rebate. So from the spirit supplier, the neutral spirits gets diluted and put into bond, and then you have your spirit enhancement making your gin and your bottling. That's the three ways we use the bonded warehouse. And please note, you cannot make the product, bottle the product, put it in bond for a couple of months and take it out later to sell locally. Can't do that. You'll pay massive fines uh, if you try, even try to do that type of declaration. It's a whole process. Let's say you put something in for it, and that happened now with COVID. When we couldn't transport, a lot of guys had orders in bond, and then we weren't allowed to, to transport it, and the clients overseas canceled the orders, and they had to go through this whole process of getting it out of bond again so that they can sell it locally. Um, massive amounts of paperwork, and luckily we got that they didn't have to pay fines because it wasn't their fault. The government didn't allow them to export, so they couldn't uh, raise the fines, but normally there would be fines. Example floor layouts. This is a... I wouldn't say, well, floor space-wise, it's small. It's 12 meters by 7.5 meters is this distillery. This one can do 5,000 bottles a month. Um, you could make this a lot smaller. The reason why it's quite big is because it uses a multi-column still. Multi-column stills take up space. So raw material prep area, making the fermentation into the fermentation tanks, feeding the still. From the still, we've got a faint tank where we store our heads, hearts, and, uh, sorry, our heads and tails, the holding tank for our distillate for our hearts. You've got a clean water tank, blending and mixing tank where we dilute down to uh, strength, and then an infusion tank. So let's say this would be a rum distillery. That's where we make our spice drum. That feeds straight into the bottling line where we've got our bottle pallets. Next to this would be the bottle washer. So you've got your filler, capper, sealer, labeler, packing, and final product. Over here, I've got my lab area. Filing cabinet, fridge for my yeast and my enzymes, desk, workbench. Over here is my clean storage. Far away as possible from the dirty area. Okay? So this is a basic setup. One interesting thing here, you'll note the bund wall. Now, the bund wall is not always a legal requirement. It depends on the fine specter you're working with. It's a wall, normally we say a meter high, but the height has nothing to do with it. If you take the height of the wall times the length of the wall, gives you the area, in, uh, times the width of the wall, the area enclosed. That volume that is enclosed has to be at least equal to the largest holding tank in that area. The thinking being that chance of all the tanks failing at the same time is nil. But if a tank should fail, if the biggest tank should fail and all the alcohol leaks out, the bund wall must contain that alcohol within that space so it doesn't run all over the floor in the entire distillery where it can ignite and start a fire or spread a fire if it's already burning. That is the thinking of the bund wall. In some cases, the fire inspector might insist that here on the exterior wall, there has to be a drain. So that if the tank leaked and the bund wall is filled up, I can now open the drain as the fire department, drain all that alcohol out so before we go in and try to fight the fire. But that's, it's very rare. These days, the bund wall is not really enforced anymore. And there's also an exclusion factor where if you've got a sloped floor with a floor drain, they say you don't need the bund wall anymore. Because the thinking would be that if there's a leak, the alcohol would run down to the floor drain and go into the sewage system. Um, that was the excuse a national manufacturer used a while ago to declare a loss of about 120,000 liters of brandy that mysteriously disappeared. Somebody left the tank open, apparently. Okay, so, but we're not going to name names or point fingers or anything like that. So this is a basic layout. Now, how does this relate to the production flow? It's exactly what I'd explain to you now. Raw material, make the fermentation, into the fermentation, into the spirits, goes into the bottle, and the product goes out. Okay, that's a example of a layout. This one's a bit bigger. This is 30 meters by about uh, 25 meters, if I remember correctly. So... Front of us area, got my tasting room, bar, bathrooms for the guests, kitchen to make snacks and platters and stuff. 
Um, at the top, we've got our raw material storage, and the raw material comes in there. I don't want to bring my raw material in the front through the guest, it comes in at the back. Next to that, separated my bottle and closure storage, so I'm still receiving at the back, out of sight, but clean storage separate from dirty storage. Um, lab and development area, office area. Ideally, and that's a mistake on this design, this whole wall here would be what? Glass, a window. You want people to see your operation. You want to show that off. You don't want to hide it. Now, this is a very early example of a phase design, but it's a different method of doing the phase design, where you've got a production line, and you are now multiplying the line. So you start with one production line. You reach capacity. You add another production line. You reach capacity. You no add another two lines. Okay? Each line is now the process where we've got the mash done, we make the fermentation, filling our fermentation tanks, goes to stripping still, low wine holding tank, spirit still, spirit holding tank, blending tank, bottling line. Okay? In the middle, we've got our drainage grid, which leads to an effluent sump, flows to the middle. Angled or sloped floor, so any water, any dirt flows to the middle, to the drainage channel, and gets taken out. Now, a plant this big, this one does uh, 45,000 bottles a month, um, you ain't running this over electricity. So you've got a steam generator on the outside. Now, a steam generator burns fuel to generate steam, and that steam gets pumped into jackets, so it's indirect heating. Very efficient, very fast. The issue with steam does come in, firstly, the steam generator itself is expensive. You're looking at minimum 500,000 just for the steam generator. And you have to think about what fuel source are you going to be using. So small ones, light oil or gas. That's, but now, where are you going to store the light oil or gas? Now, you need big enough premises. You need to have a safe area far enough away, especially if it's gas, to store those, uh, that gas. You need to think of gas deliveries, etc., etc. There's a lot of issues involved with that. Once you go bigger, we, I did a quote now recently for a plant in Gegluwe, uh 10,000 liters a day of 96% alcohol, of pineapple. So basically NCP Odemoulin, but running off pineapple instead of grapes and sugar cane juice. Um, and the total quote was 92 million for the project, so we're waiting on feedback. We're a little bit over budget. Um, so, okay, but they, okay, we're 100% in budget for the actual columns, but we used up the entire budget on the columns. The, they didn't consider the fact that you now need the warehouses, you need the boilers, and amongst other things, they have a 10 ton Steam generator, 10 tons of steam per hour, running off coal. They need 35 truckloads of coal per day to run that place. So I don't think it's going to happen. But unfortunately, it would have been a nice commission. But the, um, the issue is when you go that big, there's all kinds of things you have to think about. Uh, I had to work, get a design for a way bridge to weigh the stock coming in, the pineapples. That was a fortune on its own. And, and even a helipad. I had to design a helipad. It was a very interesting process for emergency evacuation in the case of fires and stuff. They, they needed, it required a helipad. But so steam generators we, becomes required above 1,200 liters. If either your mash tun or your stripping still goes above 1,200 liters, you can't run it off electricity anymore. Now, to give you an indication for those of you that want to do power calculations or you're thinking of a premises you want to work out, do I have enough power? Direct heating element inside the liquid, 6 kilowatts per 100 liter capacity. That's how much you need. Indirect heating, jacket, 8 kilowatts per 100 liter capacity. So that 800 liter stripping still over there requires 72 kilowatts. Okay? Sorry, 64 kilowatts. 64 kilowatts for that 800 liter uh, stripping still. Now, the power adds up quite quickly. Because let's say I'm an 800 liter grain distillery. That means I've got a 1,000 liter, and I'm going to write those figures down here on the board. I've got a 1,000 liter mash done, so that would be 80 kilowatts. I've got an 800-liter stripping still. That would be 64 kilowatts. I've got a 400-liter direct-heated stripping still. That's 24 kilowatts. Add that up, gives me 868 kilowatts to run all of that at the same time. There's no way you're going to put that with standard load in any um, farm or light industrial facility. You'll have to get an increase in power. Now, there is a way around that. Let's say you've got 
enough for 120 kilowatts, argument sake. If you plan your production, if you plan your day correctly, you could make that work. Where you come in early morning, or you put it on a timer, and your mash tun goes on on a timer. It's safe, it's water. There's no alcohol involved. So your timer turns on at 6 o'clock. Okay? The, the way we design our equipment, your bring to boil is 90 minutes. Okay? With the ratings I gave you now, that's enough to get it to bring to boil in 90 minutes. So by 7.30, the mash tun will be at temperature. And you add your grain and you boil it for half an hour. That's it. Then you turn your elements off. Then the mash tun's done. So 8 o'clock, I can turn on my stripping still. My stripping still will run at 64 kilowatts for 90 minutes, till 9.30. Then I run it at half power. So I turn it down to 32 uh, kilowatts. Now I've got enough power to start up my stripping still, or my spirit still, and that run will be about seven hours. So I'll finish at 16.30, I'll be done by five. That's production planning, and that's what we help you with. And even in the, in the cash flow analysis sheet, or one of the sheets in the business course is a time planning sheet. that pl it plans your time per day, per week, per month, even down to the bottling. How long will it take you to bottle X amount of bottles per day or per week? Because you're not going to bottle per day. That small little enolmatic bottle filler, single head enolmatic bottle filler, does 300 bottles an hour. You're not going to spend five minutes bottling a day. You're going to stockpile and you bottle once a week. That's how you run it. So if you plan correctly, if you know how to plan correctly, you can make less power work. Just need to ask the question and we'll make it work for you. Again, production flow remains the same. Raw material comes in, we make the fermentation, we ferment, we distill, we uh, enhance, we bottle, and product out. Now, ideally, the product would not go out the front because same reason. I don't want to wheel pallets out through the tasting room, so I would put a door over here and bring it out. Don't want to take the clean product through the dirty area. But we take in, this, is, this looks very simple. It's actually not that simple. Sometimes we get floor plans that have weird shapes. Sometimes not all the walls are accessible from uh, out the outside. So that's where the experience comes in to make it work. Now, practical factors, things that you have to keep in mind regarding uh, the premises. Firstly, the distillery equipment, and then the distillery infrastructure. Because you've got the building now, so what needs to go in there? What equipment do you need? And how do we fit that equipment in? And what else does the equipment need to actually function the way we, we want it to function? I mean, it's not like I put in a still and I plug it into the water and I plug it in the power and that's all I, I need. There's other things that supports those activities that has to be incorporated as well. So our distillery equipment is divided into a couple of different categories. Raw material processing, Fermentation, distillation, spirit enhancement, storage, bottling, laboratory, heating and cooling, material handling, health and hygiene, office and admin, front of house, back of house, delivery. Okay, that's your main categories of equipment. Now you'll notice, or might recognize some of these categories, the same way we organize our website. And that's how we approach. Everything we do, we approach from the process that, guess what, this hobby guy is going to end up going commercial. So from the beginning, we get you used to thinking along those terms, understanding the processes. Now, at the moment, we do not supply those five. Health and hygiene, we, uh, we're probably going to expand our product range quite soon to start including health and hygiene. Uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, proper acid cleaning equipment and so on, we're going to start stocking that relatively soon, workwear and so on. But the rest we not, won't. Office and admin, you can go to Walton's or Macro or wherever. Front of house equipment would be your bar equipment. Um, there we can refer to you to catering suppliers, core catering, McCater, McBrothers, any of those guys. We're not going to compete against them because we can't deliver it at those prices. And they've got, we're not going to stock that range of items anyway. Um, back of house, would be your kitchen equipment and so forth, if you're doing platters and that type of thing. Take it from somebody that worked in the restaurant industry as well. You don't want to rent, uh, run a restaurant in your distillery. You don't. I'm not saying it's a bad idea to have one. What I'm saying is you don't want to run it. So plan for it and rent the space out. That's a very easy way to do it. For one of our clients, the, the concept worked great. So we. Uh, 
We're in the planning phase. COVID put a bit of a knock, knock in their plans, otherwise they would have been operational by now. But they've got this big front of house area with big glass roll-up doors. And the whole thing opens up. And they were playing around with the idea of a restaurant, and I just made the suggestion, why not food trucks? The food truck can park inside. So that means you can have another food truck in there every week, meaning that the people in your area, and they're in a good area for that, there are a lot of businesses and so on in that area, people will come for lunch every week because every week you've got a different menu. And you don't have to worry about cleaning up or making the food or supply, that's the food truck's problem. And you know, if, you're, uh, if it's a busy enough place, the guys will actually pay you for the privilege of standing there or give you a profit share or something. There's many ways to skin a cat, but do not, you do not want to run a restaurant. Restaurants are a nightmare to run. I've been there. Um, and then delivery equipment, okay, we don't, we're not going to start selling trucks. <laughs> we're not a car dealership, so yeah, we're not going to sell that either. But that is the categories of equipment you need. So what do we find in those categories? So raw material processing, working with fruit or potatoes. There it stands. The hopper is off, but it's, that's that small little stainless steel thing right there next to the copper still. That is a fruit juicer. Uh, but it can also juice uh, potatoes. So if you're making vodka from potatoes, you'll use the same thing. Now, as little as it, as small as it is, it stands there. That's about 120,000 rand. Okay? It does 400 to 600 kilograms an hour. Dynamite comes in small packages. And it separates solids and liquid. So you just throw in the whole fruit, and there you go. You, that's your juicer. Or you buy in the already processed juice. 120,000 Rand is expensive. So you might, and especially if you're dealing with a juice that's got low sugar, it's actually better to outsource that. Pay a juicing company to juice it for you and make a concentrate. As long as they're not adding sugar, that's legal. They can concentrate the natural juices. So you're not starting at 6% bricks, you're starting at 18% bricks. Argument's sake. Yes, it costs more. But that's the cost of doing business. You add that price to your actual product price, you put your profit margin on, and that's it. Don't worry. There's places where we can turn the rands and cents, there's places where it doesn't make sense to look at the, or keep the purse strings too tight. Sometimes paying a little bit more is the better option. This is an electric grain mill. If you want to mill your own grain, we also have larger hammer mills that can do uh, about two tons an hour. Um, this, I think we've got one that does 10 tons an hour. It's a sugarcane juicer. That's literally tabletop size. Um, there's one in front on display. Um, even the commercial guys, they use a big crusher to just like quickly crush and get some of the juice out, but then they take the stalks that come out of the big crusher and put it through the small one to get maximum recovery. Also, all about economics. A big crusher might do a big quantity quickly, but you're getting f half of the juice. Then you put it through there, you get the other half of the juice. Maximum yield out of your uh, per ton. That's a heated infusion tank for molasses. Put in your water, heat the water, add the molasses, and um, dilutes faster, easier. Issue always comes of how do I add the molasses? Now you get high density pumps that can actually pump molasses, but they start at 80,000 Rand. So I don't recommend that. Um, we use the pallet jacks. You will see every order that I do for you under material handling equipment will be a pallet jack, a manual one. Wide leg, the reason why we, the wide leg is a bit more expensive. It's not like I'm trying to sell more expensive stuff. The narrow leg can't fit over the, or past the truck wheels. So if you don't have a wide leg one, you can't offload off all trucks. It's the first piece of equipment that will come out of your container or out of your truck when we make a delivery because you need it to, deliver the, to take off the rest of the delivery. You need it to, deliver, to take off your bottles off the truck when they come. You need it to take off your molasses. You need it to take off the pallets of grain. You need it every single day. If you're getting in a flow bin of molasses, you're going to use that to put the molasses in your tank. You raise it up, open, and gravity feed. Yeah, it takes about an hour for the molasses to run out, but you're saving yourself 80,000 Rand using a piece of equipment you already have. And it, doesn't take, it takes 30 minutes to make a molasses fermentation, so you're not really wasting time. Um, mash tun, it's the one over there to make the grain fermentations. Mash tuns have to be bigger than. Uh, it's one of the things we've now decided. We always try to save clients cost. It's creating situations now where uh, it aggravates things. So that's one place where I'm no longer looking to cut cost. It costs what it costs. You cannot use a 400 liter mash tun for, to make a 400 liter, or sorry, to, yeah, to make a 400 liter fermentation. You can't. Out of 400 liters, you get two to 300 liters out. If you want to make a 400 liter fermentation, you need an 800 liter mash tun. Done. 
It needs to be double the size. That does make it expensive. Yes, I know that. And that's why we're working on new designs to come up with a cheaper mashed on design. So we haven't given up on it, but I'm not going to put clients in situations anymore where they have to work a 12-hour day to make, a, make it work. It's not going to happen. There's a point where you can save money. There's a point where you cannot save money. Um, with the mash tons, you need heat exchangers uh, to cool down. The, the protocols we've developed now means that we can make the heat exchangers smaller. They don't have to be as big as they were in the past, so they are now a lot cheaper um, because we've changed the way we make the co conversions, and it's proving very effective. But you still need the heat exchangers for the final cool down before you actually add the yeast. Because if the uh, fermentation is too hot and we add the yeast, what happens? Kill the yeast. Okay, so we have to cool it down to 30 degrees before we can add the yeast, at least, or maximum 30 degrees. And this is then hydraulic fruit press. This, if you want to save money, you go that route, but you don't get as much extracted as you do with this one. This one, you get about 95% juice extraction. Here, you get about 60 70% juice extraction. Then we get fermentation equipment. Now, over there is a perfect example against the wall there. Stainless steel, 800 liter, actually 1,000 liter uh, dimple jacket fermentation tank. Stainless steel fermentation tanks are preferred because it's easy to clean, easy to keep clean, easy to sanitize because you can use steam, for instance, or CIP, and you can control the temperature of the jacket to circulate uh, water through to keep the fermentation constant. But if you've got a limited budget, we can look at plastic. There's nothing wrong with a plastic tank. As long as it's the right type of plastic, you can use a plastic tank. The drawbacks of plastic, however, is um, firstly, it's difficult to sanitize. It damages, it gets... Um, worn on the inside, so bacteria sits in there. So if you're doing grain fermentations, big problem. You have to replace them after about two years because they just start looking awful. Uh, temperature control is not impossible, but difficult. We can put, for instance, a, we can create big copper cooling coils, put that on the inside and control the temperature that way. So it can be done, it's just difficult. But the big drawback of it is consumer perception. I know plastic's fine. You know plastic's fine, because I told you now it is. But consumers don't know that. They still have the perception that plastic leaches chemical into your fermentation, so that your fermentation is contaminated, your product's contaminated, so I'm not going to buy, buy your product, it's going to make me sick. That's the one part. The other part is, yeah, kind of look like a backyard operation. But if that's what your budget allows, then that's what your budget allows. And it's, now it's a question of customer education or hiding the fermentation activities. Some guys do that. It's in the back room or it's upstairs or wherever, but just not putting that part on display until we upgrade to stainless steel fermentation tanks. But it can be done. If you have to stay within your budget, we have to stay within your budget. And that's sometimes a thing that I'm going to complain now a little bit. People contact us for a quote, not giving us all the information. Some people don't want to tell you their budget because they think you're going to now push the quote to the maximum to use up all their budget. I think that's what they think. I don't know. But now they ask, they give us the minimum amount of information, we do the quote, we send it to them, and then you never hear from them again because they now obviously assumed, or they're not assumed, but they just decided we're too expensive. Where if you come back to us and say, no, we can't afford that, what can we do? Then we make another plan. We will quote for the best possible setup for you to do the job, what we know to be the best setup to give the best results. But if that's not in your budget, then we'd make a different plan. You can always adapt. Fermentation temperature control, we've changed that now as well. We're not doing single controls per tank anymore. We're doing a main control box where you control all your tanks from one main control box, your fermentation tanks. Um, so again, the phase design uh, plays a role here where we know you're going to end up with six tanks, so we designed the box to allow for six tanks. Not putting the electronics in yet because that would up the price. We just leave the spaces. So if you want to upgrade, we send you the tank with the module, you unscrew the cover plate, put in the module, plug and play, there you go. The, tank, the system operates the way it's supposed to. Distillation equipment, boilers, direct heated boilers, jacketed boilers. This would be required if you've got solids in your mash, if you want to make grappa, or if you want to do infused distillation. One of the questions on our questionnaire is, what method of infusion will you be using? So if you use vapor infusion only, then I'll quote you on the direct pot, uh, boiler. But if you want to do... Um, infused distillation where the botanicals are inside the boiler, I'll quote you on that one. So that type of distillery will obviously cost more than this type of distillery. Um, if power is a problem, or if you want an off-grid distillery, or if you want to be insured against load shedding, we go for the gas-electric hybrids, where you can run it off gas or off electricity. So if the power is on, we use electricity. If 
powers off, we switch over to gas. Gas is more expensive than electricity. Even at the prices we're paying and going to pay in future, electricity is still cheaper than gas. Only drawback with that is your maximum size is 230 liters. We can't run gas unless it's specially designed uh, boilers, which cost a fortune. 230 liters maximum, so you might end up with multiple stills, but that's fine. They, they're actually quite cheap. There's one over there underneath the first aid box. It's about 23,000 rand, um, which compared to some of the jacketed boilers is on a lot more expensive. We also do obviously do the elements, the heating control systems, all our stuff, all our control systems, all our electrics is done in-house. We've got our own in-house electronic engineer that does and builds every single box. Everything is SA, uh, or SUNS and SABS compliant. Um, which is important because if you don't have a, a compliant box and there's a fire or explosion, your insurance is not going to pay out. If you can't prove that the box was compliant, your insurance is not going to pay out. We actually did an accident investigation report now beginning of the year. Although some people on Facebook thought I was try making it up to try and scare people, it was actually the truth. Two people died, two more were seriously injured, one was in hospital for about four months. And one of the contributing factors was that the box was not compliant. The box uses a contactor with PID. Firstly, you don't distill with PIDs. Secondly, you never use a contactor in a control box in a flammable area. So there was, the still was faulty as well. The still burst. There was a pressure buildup, which should never happen. It burst because there was bad welding. And then the fumes f went, filled up the entire place, which was still OK up to that point. And then because of the drop in, in temperature, the contact engage created a spark and the old place blew up. The building across the road's wall was caved in. Uh, it's, it was massive. It was, I mean, it was 1,500 liters still. So, and this was because there's guys out there selling equipment that doesn't have a clue what they're doing. So you need to make sure the equipment is safe to use. Now, when we're looking at types of stills, this is African spirits. So, that's 1,600 liters. That's double that one that's over there. So the vapor chambers we use only in stripping stills. You don't need a vapor chamber. It can be a straight-up column. It can be a pipe. Okay? So if you want to save money, that's a place we can save money. Instead of putting the copper vapor chamber, we put a straight-up stainless steel pipe. You save yourself 18, 19, 20,000 rand. That's a marketing decision. It looks good. No, people want to see that. They want to take selfies next to it. They'll charge for selfies. Ten rand a selfie. Come on. Pay up. You pay up. It will pay itself in the end. People will pay ten rand to take a selfie there. Your distillation columns. Number of diameter of the column, I've already explained. The bigger the boiler, the wider the diameter. Number of plates depends on what you want to make. You want to make brandy mampu, something with a lot of flavor, four to six plates. You want to make whiskey, six to eight plates. You want to make vodka, ten to twelve plates. Maybe eight, but it's going to take longer. The number of plates allows you to attain and maintain purity faster. So you can run the still faster with a larger number of plates without um, losing purity. So the whole thing, those of you that's done distillation training with us, you'll know internal reflux versus adjustable reflux. The more internal reflux I have, the more plates I have, the less adjustable reflux I have to use, the faster I can run my still and still maintain purity. That's what that allows us to do. So depending on the product that you're making or products that you're making, we will specify the number of plates accordingly, and that will determine what still you're using. Now, in the end, you will end up with multiple stills. If you're doing a phase design approach, you will end up with multiple stills. Now, those of you that's done our whiskey training course or our C10 comprehensive distilling course, you would have, uh, remember there's a video there, specific, the title of the video is using multiple still types in a craft distillery. Now, the, it's about an hour long video because I do a full case analysis where I actually explain the phase design approach in a lot of detail as well. But the main thing to very summarize it quickly is that you can start with a 100 liter still. And you can use that to do stripping runs, spirit runs, and ginning runs. So Monday, I do two stripping runs. Because stripping runs are fast, four hours and they're done. So Monday, I process 200 liters, two stripping runs. Tuesday, I do another 200 liters, two stripping runs. Wednesday, do another 200 liters, two stripping runs. So I've processed 600 liters of fermentation. Now 600 of liters, sorry, 600 liters of fermentation, if I strip it, let's say, through 12 plates, I'll end up with less than 100 liters of low wine at about 40-50%. Okay? Now, Thursday, I do one spirit run, one vodka run on Thursday with all of the low wines I've created over the previous three days. And um, Friday, I do my ginning run. 
I turn that vodka into gin. All with the same still. Okay, that will allow me, assuming a 10% fermentation, that will allow me to do 150 bottles in that week. And that'll give me 600 bottles in a month. Okay, so now I'm making 600 bottles a month, I'm selling 600 bottles in a month. So it's time to do what? Upgrade, expand my operation. So what do I do? I add on a 200 liter stripping still. One thing, 200 liter boiler with head and a condenser. So now Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I can strip two to 400 liters a day. Okay, I can do two runs a day. Stripping runs are fast. So I can now do 1,000 liters a week, which translates to 250 bottles a week. Okay, 1,000 bottles a month. I've almost doubled my capacity. I'm using my strip and my 100 liters still, I'm still using that. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, um, sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm doing my spirit runs. Friday, I'm, still, I'm doing two ginning runs now. Still using the same equipment. Now I've reached my capacity. I'm producing, sorry, I, didn't, I don't think I did the right calculation there. 1,000, 10, oh, sorry, 250, that's 250, yeah, it's 1,000 bottles a week. Sorry. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, that's if I do one stripping run a day. Two stripping runs a day, I'm doing 2,000 bottles a month. Sorry, that's why I was confused now. So I can now do 2,000 bottles a month. Now I'm producing 2,000 bottles a month, I'm selling 2,000 bottles a month, it's time to upgrade. Now I put a column on my 200 liter boiler, I put a, uh, add a 400 liter stripping still. So my 100 liter now becomes a dedicated ginning still. So every day I'm stripping 800 liters, every day I'm distilling the low wines to vodka, and every day I'm turning the vodka into gin. Now if I'm doing two stripping runs a day, that gives me 800 liters, so it's 8 times 25, times 5, times, uh, sorry, 4. Now I'm doing 4,000 bottles a month. And all I've done for each phase, I added one piece of distilling equipment and one or two fermentation tanks. Minimal upgrade cost, because you planned ahead. Your distillery was planned the right way. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You can add stills as you go. Your license is not affected. Nothing. The only way your license is affected is if you exceed the maximum production quantity for micro liquor manufacturing, which is 5 million bottles. <laughs> so that should be after, what, two years? <laughs> yeah. So if you're making more than 5 million bottles per year, you have to apply for a different license. So then, yes, then it will be affected, but otherwise you're fine. Okay. What I do recommend, however, is to, from the beginning, submit the plan for phase three so that you don't have to up update the plan the whole time, but that's what I do recommend. Okay, so you will end up with multiple stills, but please note, nothing, nothing gets wasted. Even if you upgrade your ginning still later to a 200 liter ginning still, that 100 liter still will remain your product development still. That's gonna be your experimental still, your lab still, you're gonna test products, you're not gonna do recipe development in the 800 liter still. I would admire your courage, but no, <laughs> you're not going to do that. You're going to develop recipes in small scale. That's why you don't find these things generally secondhand, not from a commercial distillery in any way. Everything gets utilized, everything gets, stays there. Also note, I never mentioned anything about upgrading the bottling lines. It doesn't need to. The smallest bottling line that we can provide is sufficient for the largest craft distillery we can build. Your Aura water filter, that's the second most important piece of equipment in your entire distillery because every drop of water in every bottle that you sell comes out of that filter. That has 100 liters an hour. Never needs to be upgraded. Single aid vacuum bottle filler, 300 bottles an hour. If you have a dedicated guy filling bottles eight hours a day, that's 2,400 bottles a day. Never needs to be upgraded. Single round bottle, lab manual bottle labeler, 650 bottles an hour. Never needs to be upgraded. So. What you start with in terms of your peripheral equipment never needs to be upgraded. That evaporative cooler over there, that's what we use to do all our closed loop recirculation water systems. We don't waste water. We use 38 liters of water plus what's in the pipes to cool your entire distillery. That's the smallest unit we do, the 5,000 liter an hour one. That's sufficient for up to a 1,000 liter distillery. Okay, never needs to be upgraded. We design for growth. Okay, multi-column stills, this is open Hopkins. 
We started them to 2014. They started with a 400 liter setup. And 2017, 2018, we put in this 800 liter multi column for them to keep up with their demand. Now, Hope does their own product line, but they also do about 40, I think, 50 or 40 contract distilled products. Many of the products on your tables come, uh, is made by Open Hopkins on a contract basis. Um, multi column stills are awesome to look at. They are awesome to look at. That's about it. Practically speaking, there's no difference between this still and that still. There's no practical difference between a multi-column still and a fractionating reflux column still, modular still. Because if I want to make how the fractionating reflux column still works, if I want to make brandy, I put in four to six plates. If I want to make whiskey, I put six to eight plates. If I want to make vodka, I put eight to ten to twelve plates. If I want to make gin, I put in four plates, take out the bubble plates and put in a gin in it. That's it. Multi-column still, I want to do a stripping run, I send it up over into the condenser. I want to make brandy, I send it up, over, down, through four plates into the condenser. I want to make whiskey, I send it up, over, down, normally through eight plates, not 12, and to the condenser. I want to make vodka, up, over, down, through four plates, over, down, through eight, or in this case, 12 plates, so 16 plates in total, and to the condenser. I want to make gin, up, over, down, through the ginning head, and to the condenser. So they have to take it apart and put it back together in a different way. Yeah, open, close the tap. Plus, press a button, it cleans itself. Which is a benefit. Believe, that, that makes a benefit. But a 100 liter 16 plate with a ginning head is going to cost you about 49,000 Rand. Okay? This is also 100 liter, and that's 290,000 Rand. Okay, that, that's a big price difference. And the price difference is uh, to clean it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I can hire somebody to clean my stall for me, and it'll still work me out cheaper. This is a marketing decision. This is your selfie post. This is where you put the selfie frame around. And actually, nobody's done that yet, which is weird. I can't believe nobody's done that yet. But this is, this is a marketing decision, and you need to decide, is the marketing benefit of having that sufficient to validate the price difference? For some guys, yes, no-brainer. African Spirits, have, they bought two. I mean, listen, we were installing the 200-liter multi-column. We were busy installing it, and um, Fritz walked in and took a look and said, yeah, the place is off balance now. Bring me another one for that side. Okay, cool. Because the ambience was everything for him, and asked the guys that was at the distillery experience, it works. The place looks amazing. That's why they make a killing out of private events and functions. It was an investment in decor, for lack of a better word. You need to decide, is, does that, is that validated in your setup or not? Um, but they do look beautiful. Okay. There's also cheaper versions of it. The lighting's a bit bad here, but this is the one we did in Kenya. This is a eight, also an 800 liter with a 1,600 liter stripping still. Um, saved cost because we went stainless uh, on the column, or on the primary vodka column. Uh, this is to make vodka from grapes. Um, they're not doing tours, they're not doing tasting, so copper wasn't a deciding factor. So about 200,000 rand saved just because they went stainless and not copper. But still, they are expensive. Then you get your hybrid stills, which is a variation on the multi-column stills, and you would think they would be cheaper. They're actually more expensive. Um, the newest price I got on the 800-liter version like this, um, this is the one we put in for Honeybush Gin, um, Salt and Copper, the restaurant with the distillery in outside Mossel Bay. This is there still. Um, the updated price now is a million rand <laughs> for that unit. It makes a thousand bottles of gin a day. So you, it, you'll, if you can push those volumes, you'll pay it off in a month. But um, yeah, it's, it's expensive. We actually queried that. We thought there was a typo or something. But then the flippin', I almost called him a name now, sends us back the stock market analysis of the price of stainless steel and copper. <laughs> it says, there's your reason. That and shipping costs. Shipping costs have just gotten ridiculous. Um, but again, marketing decision, not a practical decision. 
Spirit enhancement equipment, ginning stalls, filters, air stones for rousing or aerating, infusion for macerating, for making colored gins or flavored uh, rums, homogenizers, we use that to make cream liqueurs to stop them from separating. Then you get your storage equipment, storage tanks. Um, one thing very exciting, we are expecting our delivery in next week, hopefully. Uh, we've sourced a, a supplier from Italy now for what we're going to be terming budget holding tanks. Stainless steel tanks, still stainless steel, uh, but they don't have a level indicator. They've only got one tap, and they're not mirror polished, they're brushed. Um, but they're one quarter the price of our current holding tanks. So where a 400 liter holding tank is currently, I think, 32,000, the new ones will be 8,000. If you consider that you've got about, on average, three to six holding tanks in a distillery, saving 20,000 plus per tank, that makes a hell of a difference. Um, so that's going to make all our quotes a lot cheaper now. And we've already quoted on a couple of them, and it makes a big difference. You've got your barrel racks for barrel storage. You can stack them on top of one another, move them around with your pallet stacker. Again, pallet stacker. Grain bins, like the one there behind you, to store your spent grain until it gets picked up by a farmer or something. Um, small heads and tails tanks, and obviously then water tanks. Um, now, if you want to use a plastic water holding tank, you're not going to buy that from us. You're going to buy it from JoJo Tanks Direct. But keep in mind, it's equipment you're going to need. Your bottling line, I already spoke about most of it, but you've got your bottle washer, forehead bottle filler, forehead bottle filler with built-in filter. Um, the most important piece of equipment, your stainless steel tables. Um, that's a heat shrink gun for your shrink wrap seal, manual or electric bottle labelers. And then these are mini bottle fillers. The small little bottles that you see these days, the 50 mil, 25 mil, 100 mil, 250 mil, that's what we use. Uh, the Enomatic's not on here. Oh, the Enomatic's on the next page. So that's the Enomatic single head bottle filler. 90% um, of the distilleries we're setting up now is taking the Enomatic. The nice thing about it, except its price, where this one is about 30,000, this one's about 60,000. Enomatic's 11,000, I think, something like that. And with that, you can buy the tandem filter, which plugs in. And in here, you can put either fiber or stainless steel filters. So where instead of paying 60,000 Rand for something that is 500 bottles an hour, you're paying 20,000 Rand with, with the filter in place for something that does 300 bottles an hour. So it's a no-brainer. Also which the other system can't do, you can put more or two of these in line with one another. So you can have a stainless steel 5 micron filter, which is washable, followed by a 0.9 micron fiber filter. Now the reason we do that, fiber filters can't be washed. They, once they're saturated, you have to throw them away and buy a new one. Where the stainless steel filter can be washed. So by using the stainless steel filter first, you extend the life expectancy of the fiber filter so you don't have to replace one every month. They last two, three, four months, depending on how much they're filtering out. So works a lot better. Also, they've got adjustable heads. So this can also take a mini head. It can take a jar head. It can take a bottle, uh, beer bottle head. You can use it to do all kinds of things. You can also uh, fill the cures with it, which you can't do with the gravity feed of the other filler. And you can even do essential oils with it or olive oil, balsamic vinegar, whatever. I don't recommend using the olive oil one for the spirits as well, though. You might want to buy two of them. And then your RO water filter, as I mentioned. That's all the things that's in your bottling line. Laboratory equipment, your measuring equipment. Um, this one we do not supply, unfortunately. Um, you will buy this from Anton Parr directly. I highly recommend you get it. It's an Anton Parr Easy Dense Digital Alcohol Meter. They're about varied depending on exchange rate, 9 to 11,000 Rand. You will never look back because it's accurate to within 0.5%, which is the legal requirement. Okay? So no more adjusting for temperature, no using temperature calibration charts, no working on mass because the, there was contraction when you diluted. All those problems disappear because you just take a sample of the syringe, put it through there, it sends it uh, to the app on your phone, and whoop, you know exactly what the alcohol percentage is. But it still cannot measure anything with sugar. Okay? Anything with sugar, if you're making the cre liqueur, spirit aperitifs, doing um, obscuration on your brandy or on your rum, you have to send it for laboratory analysis. Or you can buy the Anton Parr alkalizer, it's 590,000 Rand. Um, but you can buy that if you want to and do the test yourself. But 
preferred methodology is send it to either VinLab in Stellenbosch or Integral Labs in Paul, and they'll analyze it for you. 360 Rand for the test. On that, guys always say, but how do I know what percentage to put on my Lakia label? How do I know what percentage it is? Now, you can work it out mathematically, and you might be accurate within 1% or 2%, but legal requirement is 0.5%. So my answer to you is make it. Work it out to make sure you're in the range where you want to be or close to it, uh, at least above the minimum. Then you send your sample away, and whatever the sample says, that's what you put on your label. Okay, there's no point in trying to make it work because you're going to spend weeks or months trying to make it work to achieve the exact percentage that you want. On alcohol, or on liqueurs and spirit aperitifs, your excise is so low in any case, it, it doesn't matter if you're paying one rand a bottle more. So rather just do it that way. Um, eating and cooling. Steam generator, as I mentioned before, evaporative cooler. Also can use chillers, but I don't recommend chillers. They're noisy and they're very expensive. A five kilowatt chiller, now remember when you spec chillers, you have to look at the total heat addition, how many kilowatts you're putting out and in, and you have to have a chiller that takes the same amount of kilowatts in, which means for a 50 liter boiler, which uses a five kilowatt element, you need a five kilowatt chiller, which costs 60,000 Rand opposed to the 50,000 rand for the evaporative cooler that can handle anything up to 168 kilowatts. It's a no-brainer. You're not going to use a chiller. Okay? You're using the evaporative cooler. Only place where evaporative coolers are a little bit of an issue is in um, high air pressure, um, high humidity environments. Durban, Mozambique. It can be an issue there, but we've installed them in Mozambique, we've installed them in Durban, they work fine. Then we just do the bigger ones. We do the 10,000 liter per hour ones and not the 5,000. They work fine. Um, solar, not really a, an option, but we are working with a research group at the moment that's working on uh, what they call solar concentrators. Now, the solar concentrator can create about 48 kilowatts of steam and 5 kilowatts of electricity with one concentrator. And they're looking at a cost of less than 90,000 Rand for one concentrator. Um, so they're still in the developmental phase, and we're working with them to do practical testing and so on. So hopefully within the next year or so, that would be an option, which would be great for off-grid distilleries and so on. Material handling is to move stuff around. Your pumps, your pipes, your hoses, barrel picker. To now you can actually lift up that drum without having five guys that you're employing just to help you carry something around. And they're actually not that expensive. Okay, I say not that expensive, but relatively. It's 6,000 Rand, I think. But, I mean... You can now, man alone or woman alone, take a 220-litre barrel around. Your pallet stacker, as I said, first piece of equipment you have to get. And then if you're not using mash, if you're buying in alcohol, that's all you need. Magnetic coupling pump, 3,000 rand. That's for the cheap one, but does 12 litres a minute. That's more than sufficient for any distillery. Um, the more expensive one is 25 litres per minute. Um, it's okay up to 96%. Uh, waste bin, that's the wide leg pallet stacker. Oh, sorry, that's the electrical one, the one that's over there. Um, okay, that's obviously a lot more expensive. Um, only reason you would have that is if you're doing high reach, because the manual ones have a, a height limit, the electric ones don't. Um, and as I said, your waste bins and buckets. You never have enough buckets. Buckets measuring cylinders, never have enough. Standard in a quote, I put in four buckets. Okay. Distillery infrastructure. Water, electricity, drainage, ventilation, access, health and safety, security, hygiene, and then other. Other would be backup power, effluent treatment, steam generators, and so forth. Water, um, those of you that's already members of SACTI, in the SACTI library, the member access only area, there is this full, there's a very long article with the full diagram and everything about how to design your water usage system in a distillery. It's not a question of I've got a tap and everything runs from the tap because you've got different water requirements for different phases of the process. For instance, you cannot use demineralized water in your mash tun, but you do want dechlorinated water in your mash tun. You want minimal TDS, total dissolved solids, going into your RO filter to make the water as clean as possible and to extend the life expectancy of the RO filter. So you might put in a pre-filter system before the um, RO filter. Depending if you're using boil water, you might need um, to use a... Um, Water softness system, obviously, but there's also, I've got the word now, to remove metal, can't remember it, but you might want to remove the metal from the boil water. So different aspects of the system needs different water requirements, and you have to design accordingly. Electricity, 
municipal supply, municipal supply is accessible, it's cheap, but there is a capacity limitation. And then obviously in South Africa, it's unreliable. Load sharing. It's nothing worse than starting up your still or making a mash and then the power goes off. That happened uh, last Saturday. <laughs> yes, these guys were here. We were making a mash. A client was picking up all 200 liters at 1 o'clock and load shedding kicks in. I didn't know there was load shedding. And we had to postpone the whole thing for three hours before the client could collect the mash until load shedding was done. Nightmare. Now imagine that's happening while you've got stuff in pumps or in pipes and you're pumping things. It's an absolute nightmare. So unreliability is an issue. With steam, there's no capacity limitation. It's controllable, but you've got a very high capex. The equipment is expensive. There's special requirements in terms of storage and fuel and so on. And there's extra logistics. You have to find a supplier for the fuel. You have to plan out safety certifications and, and, and. So you have to keep those things in mind. Drainage, floor drains, slope floor with floor drains to clean your distillery. Distillation can be messy, especially if things go wrong. That's what I loved when I was in Italy now. They, he built it exactly how we designed it, because he could, because he owned the building. If you're renting, it's always an issue, because landlords don't normally allow you to break up the floor uh, and put in a floor drain. But he built it exactly as we spec, and it was a pleasure to work there. No matter what went wrong, and things go wrong, I'll freely admit things went wrong there, it always happens. But out comes the web, shh, done, clean. It's like it never happened, where if it's if you don't have a floor drain, if you just have, and heaven forbid, the floor's not even level, okay, now it's pooling, now you have to find mops, now you have to find rags, now you have to scoop up stuff to take it outside. It's a nightmare to keep clean. Now, the last thing you want to do after you have this great day of making fermentations and distilling and bottling and selling product, and now you come at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, now you have to spend two hours cleaning your place. That will just make the whole day a negative. Um, in Open Hopkins, one video, Lucy says a very, very true thing. Distilling is 90, uh, working or running a distillery is 10% distilling and 90% cleaning. And that's even more true in a craft distillery. Because it's not just a hygiene thing or avoiding bacterial infection and fermentation. It's because you're on show. People are visiting you. They're seeing it. You don't want the place to look messy. So you need to make the cleaning aspect of it as easy as possible. Ventilation. Legal requirement, safety requirement, common sense requirement. So getting air in, in, not out. In tractor, pushing air in at the top, creating overpressure, pushing the carbon dioxide formed during fermentation down and out through vents at the bottom. Extractor pulls the oxygen out, causes the carbon dioxide to rise faster. So you need an intractor fan blowing air inwards. Or natural ventilation, units like this, which is windproof, stops dust from blowing in. That on ground level would allow the carbon dioxide to go out. Just be aware it can create a weakness in terms of uh, somebody breaking in through the vents and so on. So just keep that in mind. Loading areas, access areas, stupid little thing that creates big problems. We cannot use these doors. We can't use them because the lip there doesn't allow any of our pallet stackers to move in and out with a load. Empty is no problem. So we can't receive deliveries on this side because that edge is too high. Luckily, we've got another door. But if you were renting half of this building and this was your only entrance, you would have to rebuild that entire door to, in order to accept del deliveries. And now you're running into problems with the guys that manage the, the, the complex and so forth. So can I get in and out here? Where am I going to offload? Distillery uh, we're doing in Midlands now. We're installing there, I think, end of this month. Big rum distillery, 800 liter rum distillery. The reason why they're not ready, one of the reasons they're not ready for us yet is they have to completely redo the loading area because they never thought about the fact that keeping it grass, the pallet jack can't move on the grass. So I have to throw concrete so that the trucks can come in there and you can offload the bottles, upload stock, and so on and so forth. So access, can you get in and out of the place? We still have a distillery now where the guys don't have a pallet stacker because they wanted to save cost, again, saving cost in the wrong place. And the other day, they d came to deliver his first bottles, 4,000 bottles, and they were going to offload by hand. 4,000 bottles offload by hand. The driver refused to wait, and he drove away. Now they have to rent a pallet stacker so he can, and pay again for a delivery so he can come and offload. There's no way a driver's a truck's going to stand there for two hours to have you offload by hand. It's not going to happen. So you have to think about the access. Health of safety infrastructure, 
fire being the uh, most important one, emergency lighting, your roots, pest control, personal protective clothing, food production space, flammable substances, public area. All of these things make a difference. Security, uh, cameras, alarm system, burglar bars, security gate, I've already mentioned that. And hygiene, CIP stands for clean in place. We're working on a new design very similar to this, which is a mobile CIP unit. So you can heat up your, uh, your acid, you can heat up your alkaline, pump is included, and you just hook it up to whatever you want to clean, be that a still, be it a fermentation tank, be it a holding tank, be it a mash tun, you spray the acid or the alkaline in, pump it out the bottom again, so you keep it, you re reuse it until you can't anymore, and then you dump it and you make up a new batch. It's the easiest way to keep your equipment clean, otherwise you need a steam cleaner to clean your equipment properly, because you sanitize it the same way. And then HACCP grade cleaning equipment. HACCP grade means, for instance, the bristles of the broom doesn't fall out. The mop hairs don't fall out. There's no chance of the cleaning equipment contaminating your product or your process. Steaming of barrels, etc., etc. And then other would be solar power, as I mentioned, steam generator, storage equipment, and then we've developed this with a company, um, local company that's making them for us, containerized effluent treatment systems. This is now for big distilleries. Large amounts of effluent, um, 20 to 30,000 uh, liters a day, to treat the wastewater coming out of the distillery, including the stillage, making it potable again, so it can go back into the systems. You can't just dump your stuff down the drain. You have to have a waste management plan. It's on our Distillic website under the articles. There's a free waste management plan. You can just download it or copy it and input your values. None of our clients have ever had an issue with it because you have to submit that as part of your license application. You have to tell them how much waste are you going to generate and what are you going to do with that waste. Now, those of you that's distilled, which I hope is everybody, would know that if you put a 10-liter fermentation in a still, there's eight liters left in the still after you've distilled. What are you going to do with that eight liters? Now, at the moment, you might be throwing it down the drain or throwing it in the garden. Commercially, you're not allowed to do that. And commercially, it's 200 liters, 400 liters, whatever. So, yeah, you can't put it down the sewer lines. It's illegal. So you have to have a plan to manage that. So either you're sending it to a farmer who's using it for feed, or you have to have a disposal company come pick it up and get rid of it. But what is your waste management plan? I have to think about that. Okay, your income factors, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go quickly here. Your peripheral income streams and space utilization. So, like I said before, you're not just going to make money out of selling alcohol. So, tastings. We charge for tastings. We charge for tours. We do off-con sales, selling bottles to take home. On-con sales, having drinks in the place. Light meals and snacks, platters, built-on chip platters, whatever. Guys get thirsty and give them something to make them thirstier. Sorry, they get hungry, but give them something to make them first here. Private events, if you have the space, utilize the space for private events. Experiences, gin classes, gin schools, blend your own, whiskey tastings, whiskey clubs, whatever. Working holidays, people pay to come work in your distillery. Did you know that? I'm not going to pay anybody to work in my distillery. They're going to pay me for the privilege of working in my distillery. And they do this. Foreigners are crazy. They pay to work. They even locals are crazy. People pay to work in the garden at Babylon Sturen. I've never had anybody offer to work in my garden. Just because Babylon Sturen is bigger, that's not fair. But people pay to work on an olive farm. They pay to harvest grapes on a grape farm. They pay to come work in your distillery. My personal craft distilling hero, Christoph Keller from Stahlemiller Distillery. He does four, two sessions a year where he takes... Um, What's the word called? Not inductees, not apprentices. Interns, thank you. For an internship, or a two-month internship, you pay 30,000 euro for the privilege of being his intern. And, you still, and that does not include your accommodation. You still have to sort of your accommodation and flights and everything as well. Why not? People take advantage of it. Pairings. I mean, these days people are pairing weird stuff. Wine and sorbet pairings, wine and ice cream pairings, brandy and chocolate pairings, brandy and chili pairings, rum and anything pairings. I mean, so, hey, it's a selling point. Um, Off-site events. Little branded vehicle, branded van, like outside, you go out and you put up a pop-up gin bar. 
My wife showed me an article the other day that apparently pop-up gin bars are still a things at weddings. I'm like, why are you looking at wedding magazines? Is there something I should know? But, but uh, I was more worried about that. But it's good to know that gin bars are still a thing. Um, corporate gifting. Making personalized bottles for corporates. We just got the Clem and Gold bottle. I think it's over there. Okay, Clem and Gold gin. Who knows the backstory of Clem and Gold gin? was never supposed to be a brand. Clem and Gold went to open Hopkins and asked them to make Christmas gifts for their farmers. And all the farmers wanted more. The demand was so high that they decided to make it a brand because their Christmas gift, their corporate gift, was so popular. Uh, contract distilling, we've discussed that already. Complementary products, what else can I make with what's available in my distillery? Spent grain, for instance. I can turn spent grain into rusks. I can turn it into health breads. I've got a, we've got one client, he does gin. His wife does essential oils from the same botanicals. She then makes soap from the essential oils of the gin botanicals, and she puts some of the spent grain into the soap as a biodegradable skin scrub. Why not? Make money out of waste. Why not? Um, merchandising, branded caps, branded T-shirts. If your brand is popular, people are going to want part of it. Mer Wilderers does that really, really well. Barrel clubs, a couple of friends buy a barrel. The rum is perfect for this, because you can do five liter barrels, 10 liter, 25, 50 liter barrels, because there's no legislation about it. So a couple of friends or a corporate or whoever buys a barrel, they pay you in advance for all of the rum that's in that barrel or going to be in that barrel. Now you put it in your bonded area, and now the club comes to visit its barrel. How are you doing? You're aging well? Let's taste it a little bit, sit, have a drink, have some other drinks. And they keep on visiting, visiting it. Every time they bring a couple of friends along, how are you doing? And by the time, hopefully, there's something left in the barrel to bottle at the end. But, I mean, you've, you've been paid up front for all of it. But there's also that marketing benefit because the whole time there's people visiting. If you're doing it with a corporate, you have a barrel filling event where they invite, invite the entire staff and top clients and you get people coming to your distillery who otherwise would never be there. We can do that with rum in South Africa. Fan club events. Start a fan club, loyalty card system, where the fans get invited to pre-launch activities or they sit on tasting panels to, to give you feedback on new product development, keeping people involved. Fan-based discount, 10% discount. Well, you're selling directly to the public. You're still making 30% more than you should. So all these things that you can do. So tastings and tours, this is just everything I've discussed already now. Um, and then space utilization, what else can we do? If we've got the space, why can't we be a wedding venue? If we've got the space and the place looks good, why can't they do fashion shoots in our distillery? If we've got the space and the ambience, why can't there be team building events or product launches, car launches in our distillery? In the end, the only thing that limits you is your own imagination. What can I do in that space? Okay, so... It's five minutes to 12, oh yeah, marketing factors, that's basically just ambience, using what's around you, and, but you can only decide that once you've chosen your location, but also your interior ambience. This is, do yourselves a favor, especially if you're a steampunk fan, Iron Balls Distillery in Thailand. It's like the most incredible place you've ever seen. Go check their videos on YouTube, check their, um, uh, w website, search Google images, it's, an am it's amazing. The, you can see the stills is an old conservatory. The entire ceiling is bottles. And the guys that started it, they're two divers, deep sea divers. So everything is like this old nautical feel to it and so on. They, that's what I call living the brand and living the dream. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, also another thing you can Google, it's uh, also a video on our um, Facebook page, Lost Spirits. It's like being on a movie set. They created the warehouse to create imaginary places where their spirits could come from. So as you walk in, there's this pool of water, and that's actually the reservoir for the cold water recirculation inside the warehouse. And you climb on a pond or raft, and you get pulled across this artificial lake inside the warehouse. And then you're in this freaking jungle, and then around, there's the stripping stills, copper stripping stills, handmade, with the outlets looking like dragons. And there's steam coming out the dragon's noses. And then you're into the island of Dr. Moreau, where it's like these 
canvas tents and also surrounded by plants and jungles and robotic parakeets saying, buy some more, buy some more, and like all kinds of weird stuff. And it's literally like creating this experience and people freak out about it. I mean, it's gimmicky. Yeah, of course it's gimmicky. But if a gimmick works, if a gimmick leads to sale and the quality of the product leads to repeat business, there's nothing wrong with a gimmick. Okay, now the question earlier, and that's the one I want to quickly discuss before we finish up. Sorry, it's a little bit over time. Um, oh, sorry, this is actually Lost Spirits. That's Lost Spirits. That's the, where you walk through to get to the dragon kettles. That's the island of Dr. Moreau. And then they've got their lab area. They've got this feel like an alien spaceship where they do the rapid maturation of their rum with intense light aging and music maturation. <laughs> Weird stuff. Okay, but I do quickly want to um, show you the cost analysis or cash flow analysis very quickly. Now, again, these are in full detail on our business course. Um, there's five case studies on the business course, and I go through all of them, basically screen recordings, as I go through them to explain how they work, how you use them, and how you can change them and manipulate them and so forth. Uh, but there should be a version there that you can already use regardless of what you want to do. There's grain-based distillery combination of whiskey, gin, and vodka, rum, etc. So this is a gin produced from neutral spirits. So the first page is your equipment list and services and so forth. Now, you'll notice the total cost 702,000, okay? I'll explain that figure just now. This is enough to make 2,000 bottles of gin per month, assuming worst case scenario. One run a day, minimal alcohol strength in the, uh, of the still of 40%, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you scroll down here, and I actually had this set up nicely, but somewhere something went wrong now, so bear with me. But you'll see the equipment here is divided into different sections. So you've got your um, bottling equipment, your uh, laboratory equipment, your material handling equipment, distillation equipment, etc. Now, bottling equipment here, and this is still old prices. Okay, so if you download this, is, uh, also say in the course, don't work according to the prices that's on the spreadsheets. That was the prices at the time when the spreadsheet was created. All of our prices, because we're downloading bulk imports, dropped down considerably, you might have noticed. So in this worst case scenario, the total cost was 708,000 for all the equipment, which is the bottling plant, 222,000, when now it's about 100,000 at the new prices. The distilling equipment here was about 100,000, which includes an 800-liter stainless, 800 stainless steel holding tank. That one right there at the back. That one is about 81,000. The new budget tanks we're bringing in is 9,000. So 72,000 rand cheaper. So massive savings already. But the other thing you have to realize is that in these sheets, it includes a bunch of stuff here at the bottom which we don't supply. 32,000 rand of office equipment. 101,000 Rand of additional services, which includes the license application, SARS registration, product approvals, and, uh, and so forth. Again, worst case scenarios. I don't paint pretty pictures. There's no point, there's no benefit, zero benefit for us to sell you a distillery and you fail. Zero benefit. Yeah, okay, make a sale. But if you fail and other people fail, that damages the industry and then we, we can close our doors. We're not going to be around. We need every one of our clients to be successful. Otherwise, we, not, we don't have a future. So everything in here, including optional services, is in here. If you don't want the service, you don't take that service. You, if you want to plumb the place yourself, you do it yourself. So you can save costs. So worst case scenario, that works out all inclusive, all the additional costs, 700,000. Okay, to that we add utility services. Now utility services is things that we well, some of you do now, normally we didn't. Like plumbing, like electrical, like building your tasting room, that we're not going to do. So there's allowances for that. There's another 250,000 Rand allowed for creating your business, creating your establishment. Okay, then we've got your packaging cost. Now, this is actual packaging cost, but also worst case scenarios. Not worst case, obviously, you can pay 100 Rand a bottle. But these days, most of these bottles, if you buy from the right suppliers, you pay about 18 to 19 rand a bottle. Not as here, 25. Your labels, front label, about 4 rand. 
one rand fifty five for a back label, your closure, two rand sixty, wax seal, eight rand twenty. Now that's from another supplier that's a lot more expensive than our price. Also, that's not a shrink wrap seal. Although you'll notice in the equipment there's a heat shrink gun not a wax dipping pot. That's because, again, worst case scenario. On equipment, I'll always co uh, quote the most expensive piece of equipment or in the cash flow analysis. For consumables, I'll quote the most expensive consumable. So again, worst case scenario. If it makes sense, worst case, it'll make sense in practice. Packaging box cost, that's for a color branded packaging box. If you're going to use a brown six bottle box, it's going to cost you half that price. And then number of bottles per box because we divide the box cost to get a per bottle price. So your packaging is going to cost you 44 Rand a bottle in this scenario. It can be as low as 20 Rand a bottle. Okay, then the startup stock, your initial stock purchase, including the bulk spirits, barrels, and so forth. But here, the bulk spirits being the big one, 154,000 Rand is your original OPEX. If you're a contract distiller, that's also what you need to budget originally, except if there's a making deposit or something like that with this uh, contract distiller. Your gin run cost. I'm not going to go through everything here, but we break it down to the cent. What does your ingredients cost? What does your electricity cost? What does your water cost? How long will it take you to do it so you can do your time planning? Everything's worked in there, including your excise tax. And that brings you down here, sorry. to a per liter excise tax inclusive price of 116 Rand per liter of product. Okay, That's including the botanicals. Now the botanicals, I don't know what your recipe is, I don't want to know what your recipe is. So for these cash flow analysis sheets, what I do is I assume you're doing 100% juniper gin. Juniper is your most expensive botanical, except if you're doing a saffron infused gin maybe. But 100% juniper gin, and I don't work on a bulk supplier price. I work on our in-store price, which is a worst case scenario. You're not going to buy 100 gram packs from us to make gin. Okay? You're going to buy, if you buy from us, you're going to buy 5 kilogram bags, or you're going to buy 25 kilogram bags from a bulk supplier. So again, worst case scenario. So excise tax included, that is a hectically worst case scenario for what it's going to cost to make a liter of gin from purchase neutral spirits. And then we take that through to the cash flow budget. Now, in here is everything. Your salaries, your rent, your internet, your telephone, your vehicle expenses, your vehicle running costs, your vehicle insurance costs, your admin electricity to keep the lights on and keep your computers running, um, even finance costs in terms of paying back a loan, a business loan, in this case, 1.5 million rand business loan. Again, worst case scenario. I assume you've got nothing. I'm assuming you fund this totally out of a loan. CapEx, OPEX, and r enough to run it for le at least three months making no sales. That's how we work this out. Absolute worst case scenario. And then in here, you can play. And you can put in different sales prices. You can put in different sales volumes. You, you can put in realistic growth. And you can work out what scenarios work? Should I employ an admin person from day one or should I employ them three months down the line? Should I pay 50 rand per square meter rent or can I afford 100 rand per square meter rent? This is what this is. It's a tool for you to work out will this work or not? Where is my break even? In this very unrealistic scenario, I started with first month you sell 60 bottles and then 120 and 180 and so forth, and you're selling it at 250 Rand a bottle. In that scenario, paying yourself a 45,000 Rand salary, because I'm not expecting you to just live off profits, you're paying yourself a salary. And with a whole bunch of expenses that actually shouldn't be necessary, you're not going to start up and buy a brand new uh, double cab as a delivery vehicle. Don't laugh, some people do that. We had one guy say, it doesn't make sense. Okay, please send me it. You got a Mercedes SLK in there. <laughs> I don't think that's a business expense. But uh, yeah, people are weird. But in this ridiculous scenario, we only s we start making profit around about a year at 1,320 bottles. In this scenario, at 1,320 bottles per month, I'm covering my rent, I'm covering my salary, I'm covering all my expenses, 
uh, if I'm selling a 250 rand a bottle. Now, what happens, and I'm just going to show you now, this is how we play with these sheets. Let's say I don't want to sell to liquor stores. I want to sell directly to the public. I want to sell cheaper than my competition, so I'm selling directly to the public at 350 rand a bottle. What happens if I change that? 350 a bottle. And now my, it's over here. I have to sell 720 bottles a month. I only have to sell 720 bottles a month. Then I pay myself my 45,000 rand a month salary, cover all my costs, the vehicle included, and the rent and everything. That's what you use this for, to do that type of planning, to see what's, what's possible. What can I do? What choices should I make? So this is gin from Purchase Neutral. If we look at the rum setup, now this is a small rum setup doing 1,500 bottles a month split between white rum and gold rum, barrel-aged rum. So the equipment cost in this scenario is a million rand. Okay? At the old pricing, including the old fermentation tax, with additional services. So the fermentation equipment is about 58,000. Oh, sorry. The, to make the fermentation is about 58,000. The actual fermentation equipment, and this is, I can't read that now, 400 liter, free 400 liter, jacketed boilers or fermentation tanks, the ones up there. With the control systems and everything, 170,000. The distillation equipment, 282,000. Bottling line stays the same, 222, but that's, like I said, way too expensive. Plus all these additional services. Um, oh yeah, I forgot, there's also like a additional expenses allowance of 50,000 Rand in there. So just mad money, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, 50,000 for the licenses, which is also too much. But there's a lot of extra cost in here to get to that, let's say, million rand setup. The utility services, we, we treat the same way. The packaging cost, we treat the same way. The startup stock will be a bit longer because now we've got things like yeast activator, we've got yeast, we've got nutrients, we've got alkalines and acids and all kinds of other stuff, as well as barrels, 12 barrels. So 157,000 rand startup stock which is about the same. See, all those peripheral stuff equals the neutral spirits we bought for the gin. But now the production sheets are a bit different because now we start with the cost to make a fermentation all the way to how many rands per liter of fermentation, including losses. There's an allowance for 5% sedimentation loss in the fermentation. That transferred to the stripping run where we've got the total cost to do a stripping run that transfers to the spirit run to make your white rum. In this case, 126 rand per liter of rum. But that's working on buying molasses from us in 35 kg barrels. Worst case scenario, you're not going to buy from us. You're going to buy 1,000 liter flow bins directly from Hewlett's. So the price is going to be less than half. Okay? And then your gold rum which is now including the barrel aging process as well as the barrel cost. And just to be totally ridiculous in terms of being conservative, I assume you're going to use the barrel once. So your entire cost of the barrel, which is again not the cost from the barrel supplier, from us, you're writing off that entire cost on a single batch, which is ridiculous. For rum, you can use the barrel 20 times at least. I like being ridiculous because if it works while I'm being ridiculous, it's going to work in practice. So barrel aged rum, 170 rand per liter of product in that ridiculous scenario. And again, that goes to the cash flow budget. But now I've got two products with two different prices. The white rum is going to be cheaper than the barrel aged rum. And based on this scenario, my break even over here 720 white rum, 540 gold rum. So that's 1,260 1, bottles. And I'm still covering my salary, I'm covering my costs, covering the vehicle, and everything. And that's assuming now that shows there in month 13, but again, I'm being ridiculous. 60 bottles, 120 bottles, 180 bottles sold. If you did your pre marketing, and you sold a thousand bottles in the first month, A for away. 
Because if there was quality in the bottle, the same guys are going to buy again. And the guys that didn't make it in time for the first month is going to pre-order for the next month. And because they're buying the white rum, they're all waiting for the gold rum to come out. So all of them are going to buy the gold rum if you did your pre-marketing correctly. So that's the rum one. Now, as I said, there's a couple of different ones, and they're all slightly different. Obviously, if you're doing... Uh, Ginning from raw material, it's different costing from ginning from a purchase neutral and so forth, but all the variations are, are in the course. Um, as to the question earlier, the gentleman asked, how much is the equipment going to cost? How much is it going to cost me to set up a distillery? There's no easy answer because it depends on too many factors. It depends on how many... Da if I want to do a 1,000 bottles a month, rum, and I'm willing to work five days a week, then I can set up a, a cheap distillery for you for 170,000 rand, 150 to 170,000. You can do that. But now the question becomes, when are you doing your marketing? When are you doing your deliveries? When are you doing your admin? Is, if you're producing five days a week, when do you have time to do the rest of the stuff? So now suddenly, okay, but now I need at least two days for deliveries and marketing, so now I can only produce three, uh, three days a, a week. So now your distillery is not going to cost you 170,000 anymore. Now it's going to cost you about 250,000 because you now need bigger equipment because you're not working five days a week. Or you need to employ an additional person, but now you have to sell more because you have to cover two salaries. There's a couple of factors involved. So if you want to know what your distillery is going to cost you, send me a mail. I'll send you the questionnaire. Some of you will be able to answer those questions now because you've been thinking about it for a while. Some of you won't be able to answer the questions now. And you'll have to think of it. Or you're going to have to set up a meeting and come sit with me and we discuss it. That's fine. In our consultations, we don't charge for. You have to fit in with my timeline. I'm very busy, you know, but <laughs> we don't charge for it. We come sit, you come sit, we talk about it. What can you do? What can't you do? What is your budget? What do you want to accomplish? And we find a way that works for you. In the end, what I want you to take from this is this is a business that can be extremely profitable. You can make a lot of money in this industry, but it's not easy money. There's going to be a capital investment, more than what you think. There's a lot of guys sitting at home at the moment that's been doing home distilling and thinking to themselves, yo, I mean, I'm going to start selling booze now. I mean, look here, my kit cost me 20,000. I can make 50 bottles a day. I'm going to sell it for 200 rand a bottle. I'm going to coin it. Not if you do it legally. It's not going to happen. And there's no plus side on doing it illegally. All these peripherals that I showed you now, all these other ways of making money, it disappears if you're illegal. Can't do any of that. You can't market properly. You can't do a Facebook ad campaign. You can't put up ads. You can't put up a billboard. So how are you going to sell it? You might be making 150 rand a bottle profit because you're illegal and you're not paying excise tax, but you're not going to make money. And the whole time, there's this sword hanging over your head. What if the police come no comes knocking on my door? It's not worth it. There's money to be made here, but you need to be dedicated. You need to be willing to put in the work. You need to be willing to work. It's not easy money. And yeah, you need some capital. So either you need an investor, or you need to take a loan, or you have the money available. In the end, anybody who wants to start a business should consider starting a craft distillery. And this is now no jokes. This is now not marketing speak. This is my personal life experience. I was operations manager for franchise groups. I was a franchisor. I was the guy selling franchises to people. I can tell you right now, Franchises don't work because the only person that makes money is the franchisor. The franchisee does not make money. And I see lots of heads nodding, so many of you have gone down that road. But forget about the franchise system. The, the type of business, be that takeaways, be that restaurants, be that bars, be that clubs, be that pubs, be that whatever you can think of. There is no business that has the potential quick return on investment that a craft distillery has. There's no business, even in a worst case scenario, your normal return on investment is 13 months. Even in a ridiculous one. With a restaurant, you're lucky. If you do a good job, you're lucky if you uh, break even or get return on investment in four years, if you're lucky. Your setup cost, there's no business that's cheaper to set up than this. You cannot set up a takeaway shop for less than three million rand. You can't do it. It's not possible, even if it's not a franchise. 
You should see the distillery I can set up for you for two million, even for a million, even for 800,000. I can set up a beast of a distillery that will look good and be good and be able to produce a lot. So the setup costs way less than any other business. Your time, this is a nine to five, eight to five, five day job. I'm not gonna say Monday to Friday because not the damn are you closed on a Saturday. Not the Johns. Saturdays are when you're coining because that's when people come to visit you and your tasting room is gonna be pumping. You're off Sunday and Monday, not Saturday. You don't need a big workforce. A takeaway shop, 22, 20 to 22 people minimum, front of us, back of us, working shifts. And you start seven, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, you're done maybe 11 o'clock at night. This, like I said, 8 to 5, 1,000 bottle a month distillery, I'm doing that on my own. I don't need anybody helping me to do a 1,000 bottle a month distillery. 10,000 bottles a month, maybe three people. Okay, mind you, I'm lying. 1,000 bottles a month, I'm still employing somebody to clean because I ain't cleaning on my own. <laughs> and bottle filling is it's not hard work, but yes, yeah, it's boring. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll employ you happy. But I'm not, it's not a labor-intensive business. You don't have massive staff over it. But still, having said that, we still employ more people on a per-bottle basis than the Stell or DGB or any of those guys. So, and the government knows that. That's why they're changing so many of the laws, because we're creating job opportunities. We are empowering people. My favorite recruitment place, you're going to laugh now. You know where I recruit guys to work in distilleries? KFC, McDonald's, kitchen staff. Why? Because they are crap hours for crap salaries. It's easy to recruit them. Plus, they've got 90% of the training you already need them to have. Clean as you go, proper cleaning procedures, stock take procedures, stock rotation. It's drilled into them in big international brands specifically. It's drilled into you from day one. They ca it's second nature. You don't, that's the most difficult thing to teach somebody. Our clients, you know, I have the most trouble with. The doctors, the engineers, the accountants, the architects, the... You can't teach them to clean up after themselves. I am kidding you not. They cannot clean up after themselves. And like we said, 90% of running the business is cleaning. So, recruit people. They're easy to recruit. They're reliable because you're giving them an opportunity to advance themselves. You're teaching them skills. One of the guys I'm most proud of, Pinar and Sons, um, he, after he did his training, he did exactly that. Recruited guys working in that industry. They are now both assistant distillers. Where in the beginning, they were washing bottles. Now they're assistant distillers. And last time I heard, they've actually got their own brand now. Where the profits of that, that's their brand. He's create, they've got created their own brands. That's empowerment. That's upliftment. And that's things we can do in this industry. It's an industry with lots of potential. For, to be environmentally friendly, to be socially responsible. Yeah, we've had a lot of bad press with COVID. Alcohol is the evil. Alcohol causes all the problems. Alcohol caused COVID for all we know. Um, and it was ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous that if, especially in the craft industry, if you look at what the craft guys do, the way we operate, it's the people with the most passion you've seen in your life, the most social responsible attitudes you've seen in life, and the most environmentally responsible people you've seen in your life. For us, things like saving electricity, saving water, not generating waste, it's not just good business sense. It is good business sense. It's just second nature. That's how we operate. So, I've talked a lot now. <laughs> I hope you guys have got some of your questions answered. I hope you have a better idea of what is involved. And at least now we've met. So if you've got questions, if you need more information, contact us, send me a mail, pop in for a visit. We're here to help. Um, and we're not going to BS you. We're not going to give you sales talk. We can make it work, whatever your plan is. And if it's not going to work, if you do not have a big enough budget, we're going to tell you that this is not going to work. Rather look at contract distilling and start up, grow your budget, and then go commercial. We've got clients that can do that. I can, can give you five guys right now who will take your call and set up a meeting with you if you're serious to do contract distilling. Easy. And that's just here in Gauteng. Even more if we go nationwide. There's always options. We're here to help you. We're here to make things work for you. Okay. Guys, that's it from me. Is there any questions? Damn, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, thank you very much. Have a safe drive. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.